All right, guys. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I hope you had a good weekend, Thanksgiving weekend, and uh, we'll continue with the lecture. Okay. Uh, so the the last thing that we saw uh, was uh, a derivation of the prediction of pressure, fractured length, and width with the PKN model. Uh, basically, with the PKN model, we assume a, uh, a fractured height, which uh, I'm saying assume, but many times it comes from some other data. Like, for example, we were saying if we have very stiff uh, cap rock and bed rock, uh, very likely if you have a tectonic strain, your hydraulic fracture will be contained. So you can uh, more or less uh, see what is going to be your hydraulic fracture height. Uh, and so with the PKN model, with a model of viscous losses in the fracture and considering the geometry of the fracture, uh, we can predict what is going to be the fracture length, the pressure, and the width as a function of time. Um, so it, it's just uh, geometry, fluid mechanics, linear elasticity. You put all of that together, and you get uh, these equations. And we saw step by step uh, how to solve those, right? Uh, similar to the PKN model, there are uh, two other analytical models that are very useful for understanding hydraulic fracture propagation uh, before you go into something uh, more complex. And the second one is the model which is called the KGD model. And the KGD model, it's similar uh, to PKN in the sense that there is a constant uh, fracture height. But in this case, your fracture now has a plane strain assumption not as a vertical plane as we had it before but on a horizontal plane so it looks something like this this is now your plane of plane strain and according to the uh, KGD model, your fracture height, because we're assuming plane strain in these directions, that means everything is the same in the direction of the wellbore. The fracture width is the same everywhere along the wellbore. Uh, I think this drawing came out pretty well. Right, so that will be the, the 3D interpretation of that uh, KGD fracture where this is going to be the width and it's just one single value at x equal to zero. Remember that x is the distance from the wellbore and xf is a fracture half length and here we have a constant fracture height. This KGD model is uh, usually good for relatively short fractures. And when we mean short fractures, we mean that the fracture length is smaller than the fracture height. And so, because uh, this is usable for relatively short fractures, is uh, mostly used for analysis of uh, leak off tests or uh, uh, models of what are called uh, frag pack completion, something we're going to talk about a, a little bit later on, where your fractures are relatively short. Uh, le let me complete this by telling you the name of these guys. So this is someone called Christianovich, Jertzma. This guy did, did lots of things. And another one called the Clerk. So uh, that's the, the KGD model. And similar to what we did for the PKM model, uh, if we uh, assume 
constant rate uh, i if we assume a Newtonian fluid and we assume laminar flow same as we did before uh, we assume negligible toughness uh, linear elasticity uh, no leak off many assumptions right but th th these are what the ones that we need for deriving the equation similar to the ones that we did before uh, a net pressure at the tip equal to zero you do all of those assumptions and you will get to very similar equations to the ones that we had before for the fracture half length the width of the fracture and the net pressure at the at the well and I'm just going to copy these values over here uh, you also have them in in my notes so if you don't want to copy this just feel free not to do that but what I want to highlight from these equations is the dependence with time and with the injection rate uh, so similar as before these all these uh, parameters uh, well these are the parameters but all these variables depend on injection rate on fracture height on viscosity and the part of linear elasticity comes from the plane strain uh, modulus uh, this one One sixth. Oh, it's one sixth. Okay. It looks yeah. Like a T yeah. No, it's a, that's that's my my number six. <laughs> Apologies for that. And this is T to the negative one third. So similar as before, you know, we can derive these equations, and, and again, uh, the fracture length. Uh, it makes sense that it's proportional to injection rate inversely proportional to to the height of the fracture <coughs> and uh, this one is because of elasticity uh, the stiffer the rock the smaller is going to be the width of of the fracture and therefore the longer it should be for the same amount of fluid uh, similar relationship here for both of these now what is different from the PKA model is the exponent that's probably the the most important thing the fracture length increases with uh, two-thirds of time the fracture width increases with one-third of time so more curvature and look at the at the net pressure the net pressure at the wellbore now according to this model it decreases with time and this is actually what you uh, see many times in uh, especially in leak of tests where getting out of the fracture of the near wellbore region it takes uh, quite a bit of pressure and the pressure goes down uh, and usually this will happen at the beginning of uh, fracture propagation or for short fractures but when they get longer and longer uh, pressure doesn't go down actually it sometimes it could go up so remember that this type of model as we said before is good for uh, short fractures another thing about this model is that uh, it's independent of the injection rate you see there is no injection rate in here and uh, also that in practice that that's not true uh, but according to this model that that's that's what you get uh, something which is independent of injection rate and uh, And let me write that independent but as we said it is not true but remember this these all are analytical models that uh, help you understand this problem of uh, hydraulic fracture uh, propagation and there is one more oh, you have a question Hamza yeah, um, do these models consider uh, no 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 they, they already uh, 
far away from the from the wellbore, but it's a relatively short fracture uh, in in which you're just starting the the propagation. Uh, you got a question, Robert? Yes, uh, I was going to ask: Are there modifications to this model that account for changes due to injection rate, or is per, is it essentially irrelevant for short fractures? If you wanted to change your injection rate, you could do that analytically or, or numerically. Uh, so you, you, you can go that way. And, and I'm going to talk in a bit about the generalization of all these models. That of course, it's going to be done numerically, right? We're going to do it analytically. Probably you can get some analytical equations uh, for changes of injection rate, but probably they are of practic little practical use. Okay. Uh, and then my other question has yeah. to do with the coefficients. Yes. Uh, are they essentially like, do they arise from unit conversion? Yeah, no, no, these, these are like something like, say, you know, pi divided by three, stuff like that. Okay. Uh, th so th those are all are unitless uh, uh, numbers. Yes? Uh, what does it mean by Lagrangian toughness based on assumption? It, it means that in these equations, we do not consider that there is pressure needed to overcome the fracture toughness of the rock. So this is the reason why we don't use KSC. Yes, that's why KSC is not in these equations. Yes, correct. Uh, and there is one more model that we're not going to write the equations because they, they all look more or less the same. But I think it's important that that you know about these analytical models, which is the the penny or radial fracture geometry, which Basically, now th this is a, f a fully 3D model in which your fracture opens up as a pancake, right? Looks like a, a flat uh, ellipsoid. And uh, in, um, in this model, uh, uh, it's a relatively uh, simple geometry uh, and you can derive the equations for predicting again what is going to be the fracture length but in this case it's going to be the radius of the fracture what is going to be the width at the center and what is going to be also the net pressure uh, but we, we, we'll skip that some important difference with the previous fracture though is that uh, in this case Notice that the area of the fracture it increases with uh, the radius, right? The, the, this line in which you need to open new surfaces is proportional to the radius. In the other cases, the new area to open up it was independent of the fracture length. It's always the same because the fracture is always the same, and that's going to make a difference. Uh, so far, we have talked about f fracture models uh, for impermeable media. We haven't talked about leak off. And if we were to consider leak off, uh, some of these models do consider leak off, it's, it's a very loose coupling because they do not consider effective stress. You just consider leak off in terms of mass balance. But it's, it's not included in terms of uh, effective stress. As, as we know, the, the rocks are going to break because of effective stress, not because of the total stresses. So in order to, to account for that, uh, you need some other more complex uh, models. And uh, there are some analytical equations for these models. And usually, we'll refer to this type of uh, propagation as uh, fluid-driven fractures in porous media. And, and there, now we need to add uh, the leak off and effective stress with, with a more, uh, more rigorous way. There, there is one person, there, there are no books about this. There, there are just papers out there. And in books, you might find some equations. But, but there is one person that actually did a lot of work in this area. Uh, it's a professor for University of Minnesota. So if you want to uh, learn more about that, I strongly recommend that, that you read uh, papers from this author. Uh, 
we're not going to go through those, all those equations because that, that will take a, l a long time, but, but I prefer that, that we discuss a little bit conceptually uh, what is going on in this type of uh, fluid-driven fractures in porous media. And in order to do that, uh, we're going to draw a dimensionless space of hydraulic fracture propagation looking at uh, where the energy goes and where the fluid goes into fracture propagation. So let's draw here an axis in which uh, we plot the ratio of the work that goes into creating new fractures divided the work that goes into circulating the fluid in the fracture. So basically, uh, uh, here, uh, this is the work that goes into viscous losses by flowing the fluid inside the fracture, right? That takes some energy, and, and you, you need that in order to propagate the fracture. So if you have, uh, let me ask you, what would be the conditions for having uh, all of the work going into circulating the fluid rather than creating a new fracture? What would be the properties of such medium or the properties of the fluid? Did you say something? High viscosity. And, uh, and what else? Let, um, and let, let's now bring the toughness again into the picture. So the toughness to create a uh, new rock. Uh, well, no, we, we're not getting in, into dry now into the permeable part. That's going to be the other axis. But generally, if you have a rock with low fracture toughness and your fluid has a high viscosity, uh, that will go into a regime which is called uh, viscosity dominated propagation. So uh, that means that the most of, it of the of the work goes here, goes into circulating fluid, rather than creating new fractures. Remember that we say that when we have long fractures, uh, the fracture intensity usually is much higher than than the fracture uh, toughness. So it is very easy to propagate those fractures, and most of the work goes into uh, flowing the fluids. And especially if you have a high viscosity. Uh, a lot of that work is going to go into viscous losses, and that's why those are called uh, viscosity-dominated fractures. Fractures are propagating where most of the work goes into viscous losses in the fluid, rather than creating new surface. On the other hand, uh, you could use fluids that have a low viscosity, and if you are fracturing material which has a high toughness, uh, you will incur into another type of, of the other extreme of hydraulic fracture propagation or fluid-driven fracture propagation, which, how do you think is going to be called this one? This is called toughness dominated uh, propagation. So now, your work uh, is really going into opening the fractures uh, and opening new surface instead of uh, work being spent on circulating the fluid. Th this is very important. We're going to discuss a little bit more about this, but let me complete uh, this uh, diagram. So on one hand, viscosity dominated, on the other one, toughness dominated. Let's plot now here, or let's add another axis where we're going to have the volume of fluid gone into the rock. Let me add here preposition into the rock uh, divided the volume gone into, or let's say. No, not into, but the volume gone 
or the volume needed to open the fracture. So we're looking at the ratio, how much of the fluid goes into the permeable media divided the volume that actually stays in the fracture, needed to open that fracture, right? And, and similar as before here, we can uh, recognize uh, uh, two very different uh, regions uh, when the volume gone into the rock is much higher than the volume actually into the fracture, we're going to say that this is a leak of dominated uh, fracture propagation because most of the fluid goes into the rock by leak off and here on the other hand uh, we're going to have another type of uh, of propagation which is going to be called storage dominated and as we were uh, suspecting before um, very likely uh, you're going to be into a storage dominated regime whenever you have a low permeability in the rock and you're going to be into a leak of dominated regime uh, whenever you have a high permeability rock but this is not also a function this is not only a function of permeability but it's also a function of the fracture geometry and the fracture length uh, you may expect that as your fracture grows uh, longer and longer let me bring one of the let me bring the PKN fracture uh, your fracture area and your leak of area is going to be larger and larger, right? So let's say that we have a PKN fracture like this, it grows longer and longer, and uh, the work needed to open the fracture is always the same, always remains the same, and uh, what is just changing is where the fluid goes. And now let's say we have some permeability, so the fluid is leaking off out of the fractures. In many of these, uh, models, analytical models, uh, you you get to see that uh, there is a trajectory in this space of some of these fractures as time increases uh, for KGD or for PKN in which more or less this ratio remains uh, constant uh, but the if you have a permeable medium uh, you may transition into something which is initially storage dominated to something which is a uh, leak of dominated and uh, and where you start in here well that will depend on your viscosity on your toughness uh, for the same geometry you may also be somewhere over here uh, and uh, and you will have this transition uh, in which you have to consider now the the leak off Remember that we said for, for these cases, the, the area of new fracture was the same. And that's why these lines more or less stay the same in this axis. But for example, in the penny fracture model now, uh, you, the area of new fracture now is proportional to the radius. Every time uh, you make the fracture larger, you need to break more rock in order to open uh, the fracture more. So in these cases, uh, sometimes you may transition into, as a function of time, into something that starts uh, as viscosity dominated, storage dominated, to a fracture in which can go into to be leak off and toughness dominated. Uh, how much energy goes into the fracture? Uh, how much leak off? Uh, goes or how much uh, volume goes into leak off uh, the main message here is that it depends on the geometry of the fracture uh, so considering now then the leak off and in addition considering a criterion in which you include effective stress 
uh, will allow you to uh, incorporate, uh, no, let me write here, leak off. These two things, and of course you, you should put this in a rigorous uh, porous media model, will allow you to come to uh, predict the hydraulic fracture propagation in porous media. So uh, two, two more things uh, to consider. This part of uh, the shape of the hydraulic fracture is, is, is very important uh, because uh, controlling in which regime your hydraulic fracture can go, it will also dictate the shape of the fracture. So we say that the shape of the fracture or the geometry of the fracture tells you uh, where you are in this domain, where uh, at the same time, if you modify some of these variables, like for example, uh, the viscosity of the fluid, that probably is the, the most likely variable that you could vary in these cases, you're not gonna vary the toughness of the rock, you're not gonna vary the permeability of the rock that you could vary the viscosity of the, rock, of the fluid, uh, you could transition into different regimes. Uh, if you are in the viscosity dominated uh, fracture propagation, and that's where most of the hydraulic fractures in the field are, very likely you will have uh, planar fractures. Most of the work goes into opening this fracture and uh, into circulating the fluid, and not much goes into opening the rock. And that would favor, most times, a planar fracture. On the other hand, if you lower the viscosity of your fluid and you go into rather a toughness dominated regime, you could take advantage of some of the heterog natural heterogeneity in, in rocks and have more fracture tips to create uh, what is called fracture complexity. And it kind of makes sense, right? If, if your fluid, uh, if most of your energy goes into viscous losses, everything is just gonna stay here and, and you're gonna favor uh, mostly the conduit type of fracture but if your en the energy of the fluid, you do not spend it in circulating the fluid, but rather in opening new fractures, uh, that could go into opening uh, new fracture tips and creating more uh, fracture complexity. Uh, theoretically, this, this kind of makes sense, right? But uh, still, the, the issue of, uh, or the phenomenon of hydraulic fracture propagation is a little bit more complex. So I don't wanna anticipate uh, what I want to say in a in a few minutes, but for now let's let's just leave it like that. That uh, if you have more energy into uh, opening new fractures, very likely you're going to have uh, more fracture complexity. Okay, um, so let me my roadmap of what I wanted to say today. Okay, N now that we have a better idea about uh, hydraulic fracture propagation, uh, we have seen uh, our models for predicting pressure, predicting width, uh, predicting hydraulic fracture height. Uh, 
right? So you combine these type of models in which you, you know the variation of horizontal stress with this one into you know how much the fracture is going to open and you generalize this into instead of an analytical model a numerical model and there you have a hydraulic fracture propagation model that's that's everything you need and let me show you some examples over here uh, this is a software that does that it's called uh, gopher it's hydraulic fracture propagation software and basically uh, what you do is let me go to the top now instead of working in two dimensions in three dimensions you have some initial conditions properties of the rock that are going to allow you to build uh, a map of initial condition of stress to see where your fracture is going to propagate the initial conditions of stress very likely are going to dictate also what is going to be the height of the fracture and when you inject start injecting uh, fluids how long it goes so let's continue through through here so um, and now this reminds me that you are working on no you, al you already did this in I think the project number two that was calculating stress as a function of depth right for uh, given properties of the rock uh, with the sonic properties uh, those dynamic modular you you were able to compute horizontal stresses so this is the same thing is the same thing uh, with properties of the rock uh, you compute what is called a stress log and according to that stress log uh, your hydraulic fracture simulator is going to know where it's more likely that that fracture is going to uh, propagate areas of low minimum principal stress are going to favor hydraulic fracture propagation so you build that model uh, you put the geometry of where your fractures start and what you get out of that are the expected uh, hydraulic fracture shape the height which is variable as a function of uh, fracture length the fracture length right from here to there but now this, this is a is a 3d model right it's not the, the same the same height everywhere so it varies and also here in fake colors we have the width right and as you may expect the closer you are to the wellbore uh, here it's more obvious the bigger is the width of the fracture and into these hydraulic fracture models you can put several stages so uh, if you put one at the beginning the second one is going to be affected by the first one and that's what we wanted to see in a little bit something which is called uh, fracture interaction and uh, and therefore uh, that's it's going to be this is going to be a time dependent process but basically all, all these models do exactly what we have discussed before do a stress analysis and then uh, use uh, fluid mechanics and linear elasticity and that's one of the main limitations of many of these models just linear elasticity but just use fluid mechanics and linear elasticity uh, to predict what is going to be the shape of those fractures in three dimensions uh, when you have a, a variable stress field and uh, properties of the rock but basically that's everything in it yes Robert. is there commercial software that acknowledges plastic changes not that I know there are some there is some other software uh, that we're, we're going to discuss that in a little bit later that acknowledges the presence of natural fractures and sleep of fractures which that would be some sort of plastic deformation um, but in many of those all those fractures are kind of made up so even if you add more physics still you know the the use of those models I think it's still open to debate because because you're putting the fractures there on your own uh, you can have some geological data that help you to put those fractures but, but most times th those are just made up uh, 
So, but, but this is the idea, right? This is the idea. Um, this fracture width, the length and the height depend on initial conditions, but also depend on your injection rates, the viscosity of the fluids, the properties of the rock. So uh, with this and uh, taking advantage of all these very nice plots, uh, let's talk about uh, multi-stage uh, fractures. So in, uh, with multi-stage uh, hydraulic fracturing, inst instead of doing just one fracture, uh, like this one, uh, our objective is going to have many fractures from the same uh, wellboard. So, This is going to look something like this. So this multi-stage hydraulic fracturing, uh, if before you had an, a one hydraulic fracture, let's say that you have a a wellbore over here is a vertical wellbore Th that this is your your pace on if before you just had one hydraulic fracture in here the objective of hydraulic fracture is to maximize uh, the contact of the reservoir rock in contact with the fracture uh, for one wellbore so now let us drill a vertical wellbore and then a lateral out of it and now our objective is to create multiple fractures so that we maximize that surface area so now if you create start creating uh, natural fractures uh, hydraulic fractures in here and we are assuming that this is our minimum principal stress you will expect at least ideally those to grow more or less as I'm drawing over here so now instead of having just one fracture uh, in contact uh, with the reservoir rock now you have in this example nine fractures which are uh, facilitating the drainage and uh, making those production rates uh, much uh, higher than what you have with one single fracture. The big question here is, how do you choose this distance between the fractures? So in theory, you know, you will want as many fractures as possible because your surface area is going to be proportional or inversely proportional to the distance between the fractures uh, but the problem is that uh, you may not put them too close right so so this you know this is like trying to, to fit uh, I cannot find a better analogy but uh, trying to put too many people in an auditorium right you want to put as many as you can as you can so uh, you have more people in there uh, but if you put them too close probably they, they're not going to be happy right and they might leave or they might uh, uh, not like the, the show so uh, with these hydraulic fractures it's the same uh, you want to put them as close as possible but not too close because otherwise let's say now this is the top view uh, if at some point you plug your wellbore and you create one hydraulic fracture and then uh, you try to make the new hydraulic fracture but if this one is too close and if the rock is very stiff this new fracture so this was number one this new fracture may see the other fracture and start to deviate and have 
a geometry that was not the one that you expected. So this geometry over here assumes no fracture interaction, interaction, and this shape over over here is with fracture interaction. If you now try to place a third fracture uh, in this location, and this one is still too close to the other one, notice that now this one is actually closer to this one than this one was to that one, because now this one is bending to the, to the side. Probably here you will have even a more complex geometry and usually in order to propagate some of these non-planar fractures also you will need a higher net pressure in order to propagate those all, all of those which are which are not good and you may run into cases in which let's plug this one more time in which you create a hydraulic fracture <coughs> here and you may change <coughs> the direction of propagation uh, into uh, this direction and if you want to put somewhere in another one in here it may run directly you may change the stress so much that it will not propagate in this direction as you expected according to the minimum principal stress direction but it may propagate directly into the other fracture all of this is what is called fracture interaction and is caused by changes of stresses near the fracture so now in addition to S3 you have an additional stress which goes by the term <coughs> of stress shadow because that's the additional stress that uh, you put in the subsurface by adding a fracture. Remember that all of these fractures uh, need to remain open, right? Because if they close, uh, why, why did you do the fracture? And uh, part of the job of keeping this fracture open is uh, by putting the propane inside and when you put the propane inside, there is going to be, although when you're propagating the fracture, the width is going to be some width. When it closes, still is going to have some width. And that is the width that causes this additional uh, stress uh, shadow. So uh, how do you avoid this fracture interaction? Well, you need to know how close you can put your fractures and that comes just from mechanics and this is actually the objective of project number eight problem number one and uh, i hope that you had time to check the paper from professor sharma in which he discusses this issue uh, in detail. Your objective in this case, you're just going to do one hydraulic fracture. Uh, the you're going to look at how much putting that fracture in that medium changes the out of plane stress. Okay? And remember the out of plane stress is Why did I write S Y Y? Should be S C C, okay? In this case, the out of plane strain is the Poisson ratio times S X X plus S Y Y. Knowing how much you increase the stress in this direction is gonna allow you to see at which point your stress 
in the perpendicular direction to the fracture, so this is the minimum principal stress, at, at which point this stress uh, changes direction. So basically your minimum principal direction close to the fracture now is going to be in this direction. If you were to put the fracture right here, it would propagate like this. And your objective is to calculate this point, the point at which those the minimum principal stress changes direction. You have a question, Robert? Uh, this is due on Friday, I believe. Yeah, that's what the website says. Or on Thursday. Yeah, Friday? The website says Friday. Okay. So, uh, let's see. And we, we need to take about some other things, guys. So, uh, remind me, please, to, to do that. We need to talk about the exam, and we need to talk about the final project. So, okay, no, this is not the one. Yeah, this one is due November the 30th. So that's on Friday. Okay? So, um, I, I, I don't know if uh, we're going to have time to talk about free fam, but if not, uh, I'll try to send an email about it, okay? Be but I, I really uh, want to talk about, uh, about this uh, finishing hydraulic fracturing uh, topic, okay? Uh, all right, so uh, this is the whole idea in multi-stage hydraulic fracturing. Just putting more fractures and putting them as close as possible, uh, but not so close so that you may uh, lose that high reach, uh, extended reach of a hydraulic fracture as you may expect. Uh, this type of methodology of doing one fracture at a time uh, was was done several years ago, but now there is another option for this, uh, and that new option is to do uh, hydraulic fractures uh, with several fractures in a single stage. So here there is one hydraulic fracture per stage. One stage is what is in between two plugs. So, in this example, you make your wellbore, you plug it, two perforations, you fracture. Move to the next one. Plug, plug, perforation, fracture, right? One at a time. In uh, modern hydraulic fracturing, uh, you do something something different. Uh, I, I think I did a mess here with my notes, but uh, let us continue. In between plugs, uh, now instead of just having one set of perforations, you will put many sets of perforations. Each of these are called a perforation cluster, right? This is your plug, uh, this is your horizontal wellbore, and um, you have the wellbore, you plug it, make the perforations, you plug it, and then you start injecting. Uh, the question now is uh, how close you put those clusters? Uh, wh what do you think, guys? What, what would you do if, if you were designing this hydraulic fracture completion? Why? Uh, because they're open simultaneously, so the stress, stress shadow isn't as strongly present. I forgot something to say. Uh, there is a one. There is one way, as related to what you said, Robert. There is one way of 
canceling these stress effects by doing something which is which are called uh, zipper fractures in which you take advantage of the symmetry of stress interference uh, in order to create these fractures Let, let's do small diagram of that because I think it's important let's say you have three wellboards now probably they come from the same path in a zipper fracture what you would do is you will start making a fracture here a fracture there at time number one then in those same wellbores you do two other fractures but relatively far from each other so there is no stress interference and after you have done that and after you have equal amounts of stress interference or stress shadow right. you, you place a third one in there and so on right four four five and so on this is what is called uh, zipper zipper frag uh, in doing doing that you cancel these effects of stress interference and what you say over here it it makes a lot of sense right if you were able to propagate all these fractures which propagate with exactly the same length exactly at the same time in theory you will cancel out all these stress interference effects but there is a problem here uh, natural geological media are very heterogeneous all of these perforations are not exactly the same and there is a gradient of pressure going from here to there there is also a gradient of propane concentration going from here to there uh, by the way so we're injecting from here okay uh, and all of that is going to make these hydraulic fractures to have uh, very likely different lengths and some of them may grow a lot uh, some of, of them may not grow that much some of them they may never grow uh, it's according to field data 60% of these clusters can get opened when you do this type of hydraulic fraction stimulation sometimes that's fine okay but definitely you you want to understand or you want you need you want to maximize uh, the use of your perforations and the use of your uh, water and sand to use as minimum uh, resources as possible uh, to stimulate the, the same amount of, uh, of rock but something very nice about this type of uh, completion uh, which I think it takes advantage of the natural heterogeneity of the rock is that in this case you're not forcing the hydraulic fracture to propagate at a single stage now you have many of those and uh, and basically you ju you're just telling the fractures that uh, uh, whichever wants to propagate just propagate the ones that cannot propagate just don't so to me you know this is like a m much smarter way of taking advantage of the heterogeneity of the rock as I said and it's more like kind of a, a survival of the fittest for for these fractures because not all these perforations are going to be the same and not all the rock is going to be the same in the same location so just wherever possible the fracture propagates and if this fracture now fills this other fracture well it may not propagate any more in this direction but this one will so now you're taking advantage of all those interactions yes Robert. so that begs the question why bother with staging at all why not just perforate the whole length of the well work okay the problem with that is that uh, usually you have a gradient of pressure here right in order to flow fluid from here to over there uh, your net pressure is going to be higher here than here so probably if you have too many stages uh, too many clusters and too long uh, stages 
uh, the ones that are closer to the toe of the horizontal well uh, are going to be are not going to be as stimulated as the one over here and uh, I'm, and there but also you know this brings the topic of what is going to be now the distance between the plugs because you need to optimize that that's something that's going to come out from what you said uh, what is going to be the distance between the clusters that's something that uh, you have to to design and um, and again you know this this will depend on on the particular location in which in which you are working uh, but uh, I have some numbers to give you an idea uh, for hydraulic fracture in the Permian Basin okay so now there is a lot of hydraulic fracturing activity in the Permian Basin and I have some numbers to share with you about that uh, in the Permian Basin today this is the way that hydraulic fracturing is done uh, the length of the laterals it's about 10,000 even more feet which is a few miles right so so very very long laterals I, I hear laterals even as long as four miles and in each of those laterals you have about 40 stages 40 stages remember will be all of these will be one stage in each stage you have from 4 to 15 clusters each of these are the clusters in this case we have uh, four clusters uh, as you were suggesting before it appears that more cluster will will be uh, will take uh, most advantage of the rock but remember that at the same time it takes some resources to make each of those clusters and if you put too many it's very likely you're not going to open all of them uh, in each cluster uh, you also have from 6 to 20 perforations uh, these perforations probably it, it's not very clear from my from my drawing over here but usually they would go around the wellbore and they will be offset by an angle so let's say that you have a perforation here then at same distance uh, usually this is done 60 degrees you will have the next one and a little bit further away you will have another one over here and and so on right this plot is not coming very well but i hope you get you get the idea they go rotating like in a uh, um, how you call that um, a helix sort of helix way uh, how these perforation go and putting perforations and many orienta orientation also that takes advantage of the in situ stresses in order for those perforations to get hydraulic fracture to start at the perforation that has the optimal uh, orientation which you may not know but if you put many of those at different angles uh, nature is going to uh, find naturally uh, that uh, orientation so uh, a little bit more about this data uh, usually in, in this completion today you spend about 2,000 pounds or pr of propant What, what do you think uh, I'm, I'm going to give you a length here you think it's 2,000 pounds per stage 
per cluster, per half wing, per stage, 2,000 pounds of propane. So 2,000 pounds of propane, that's like one metric ton of propane. Probably that would be a box of this size. That, that would be a ton of propane. Would you say per cluster? Any other suggestion? Per linear foot of horizontal wellbore. So if you have, <laughs> if that, that's a lot. It's a lot of sand, right? So if you have a 10,000 feet wellbore, then you need uh, this number times that of pounds, which is a lot, a lot of sand. So wouldn't it be 20,000 pounds? That will be. No, that's one ton. Oh, that's yeah. one ton. It will be 10,000 tons, right? 10,000 metric tons of, uh, of sand. And also for this completion, also you need water, right? So you need water. So uh, usually average numbers give you that you need about 2,000 gallons of fracturing fluid. You know, you have more stuff there than water. Uh, also per linear foot of horizontal well, which is also a lot of water. So just to make a a uh, get a grasp about an idea about what these numbers mean. If you divide the propant times the gallons, that will give you 0.8 pounds of propant per gallon of fracturing fluid, right? So you could imagine like a gallon, right? A gallon is about this size, and inside there is uh, about one pound of sand. That's more or less the mixture that you get. If you wanted to convert this to a volume fraction, that, that will give you more or less 7% volume of propant divided volume of fracturing fluid. So again, this is propant, and this is the fluid. So this is more or less the ratio of the amount of sand that that you inject in order to keep the the fracture open. So, uh, how do you inject that that sand? So, it's clear, you know, that uh, we are injecting water in the air, and uh, most times this is done with a constant injection rate. So this is time, and this is injection rate. Usually, you would have, you start with zero, then you ramp up the injection rate of everything, all your mixture, and then you close it. How would you inject the propant? Would, would, would you inject a constant fraction from time zero? Would you expect to inject the, the to put the propant into the into the mixture? What what, what would you do? Uh, a sawtooth? What do you mean a sawtooth? Uh, Okay, okay, I see, I see what you mean. Uh, me, what did you say? Uh, first, uh, is the clean fluid to, to initiate the fracture and uh, increase the How? Linearly, in steps? In steps. Usually done in steps, right? So first, you want to open your fracture with clean fluid. That's, called, that's what it's called, the, the path. And uh, basically here, you just want to open your fracture. After your fracture is open and you make sure that there is enough width for the propans actually to flow, otherwise they, they, they won't flow, you start ramping up the propan concentration. Mm 
and this is what is usually done in uh, in practice. So uh, I think I think we're running out of time, guys, and uh, I'll, I'll see how far I, I can go in this. But uh, I, I like to discuss uh, some other mom all of all of what we have discussed before. It's more into the hydraulic fracture practice, and if, if you are interested into more of these, I strongly recommend that you take uh, Professor Sharma's uh, course on hydraulic fracturing, uh, and and you will see a lot more of these uh, of uh, applications of hydraulic fracture. Uh, we're, we're not done yet, okay? I think we have ten more minutes, right? And I want to take advantage because. Uh, well, probably we'll do it next class. But, but I want to talk about the exam and about the the final project. So we have we'll continue talking about this on Thursday. <laughs>